starting this session very shortly, so those who are standing around, we would really appreciate if you could take your seats. Thank you. A very good afternoon, Mr. Heng Sui Kiet, Minister for Finance, Republic of Singapore, His Excellency Lim Thuan Kwan, High Commissioner of Singapore to India, His Excellency Javed Hashraf, High Commissioner of India to Singapore, Ambassador Gopinath Pillay, Chairman of the Institute of South Asian Studies at Net Chairman of the Institute of South Asian Studies at the National University of Singapore and Ambassador at Large at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Singapore. Mr. Tarun Das, former chief mentor at the Confederation of Indian Industry and founding trustee of Ananta Aspen Center. Mr. Chandrajit Banerjee, director general of Confederation of Indian Industry. Professor C. Raja Mohan, director of the Institute of South Asian Studies, or ISAS for short. And Ms. Kiran Pesricha, chief executive director of the Ananta Aspen Center. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. A very good evening and welcome to Singapore Symposium 2018. Today's session is jointly organized by the Institute of South Asian Studies, the Confederation of Indian Industry, and Ananta Aspen Center. And it's my pleasure now to invite Ambassador Gopinath Pillay to deliver his welcome address. Ambassador, please. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this symposium 2018. Let me welcome the minister, Mr. Heng Sui Kiat, Minister for Finance, Singapore, the High Commissioners of Singapore to India. I'm from India to Singapore. Uh, Mr. Who are, who are the others? So, Chandrajit Banerjee, Ms. Pastrita. Kiran, Kiran Patsicha, sorry, names get mixed up in old people, you know. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm indeed very honored to have the finance minister. He started life as a civil servant and went on to politics. He's a man of tremendous knowledge, tremendous calm of mind. He's one of those very relaxed people. Under any circumstances, he always holds his own and without getting agitated. Singapore, there are many things that agitate uh, uh, people, but uh, not him. He's one of the very sober, very kind uh, a leader who actually manages a very cosmopolitan population. He is one of the as far as I can remember, one of the two who has ever been praised in public by Mr. Lee Kuan Yew, our founding father. Mr. Lee was always very forthright in his comments. If you are not very good, he will say so. There's a case of uh, many, many years ago, even before, it's only people of my age will remember it, um, of a young politician who's a member of parliament aspiring to go on to the cabinet. He was one of the few with the PhDs in those days. And Mr. Lee publicly mentioned that 
he was like a six-cylinder car that drives on four cylinders. And I think that sealed his uh, aspirations. He, so to be praised by him has got a tremendous amount of uh, sort of weight. And that is what we have, we see in Mr. Heng Sui Kiat. He's handling, he will tell you that the, uh, the many jobs that he handled, apart from being finance minister, which are all various aspects of the economy of Singapore. Let, let me thank him for being here and taking the time to give not one, but two lectures. He's the only one from Singapore who's done this. One in Bombay and one in, in, in Singapore. I'm very grateful to him. And ISAS is very happy. ISAS and CEII, who have jointly organized this, we are very happy for, uh, for his uh, ability to do this, so his consent to do this. I also want to thank my very good and old friend, Mr. Tarun Das. He tried to escape from being here. But uh, we caught him and we kept him here and made sure that he is the, the, uh, the moderator for the question and answers that we are going to have. I thank him on behalf of CII and uh, ourselves. There are one or two other people I'll thank uh, eventually. Um, you, you may not know that uh, we have so far organized six Singapore symposium. The very first one, the speaker was Mr. Lee Kuan Yew. Then we had uh, the, the present Prime Minister, Mr. Lee Sian Lung. We had Deputy Prime Minister, Mr. Tharman Shanmugaratnam. We had the then Foreign Minister, now Home Minister, Mr. Shanmugam. And we had uh, Vivian Balakrishnan. All these Singapore all these uh, leaders from Singapore were given extremely warm welcome by the people of India, wherever we organized it. And we're very thankful for that. We not only organize events in, in, in India for Singapore visiting leaders, we organize events in Singapore for visiting leaders from South Asia, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, and so on. We, we have even hosted the, president, the former president of Sri Lanka uh, in, uh, in, in Singapore. So we act as a bridge, uh, as an institution that connects South Asia with Singapore, and Singapore with South Asia. This is our main function. Today's event, as I said, is unique in that the speaker has spoken in another city and is here. And I was telling him that uh, if he can find a time, I would like to take him to the south as well. We have had so far one in Chennai by Mr. Shanmugam and also one in Colombo by Mr. Shanmugam. We should be able to have more and we will try and have that. Uh, as I said, uh, the Singapore Symposium is a part, is, is a part of an uh, ongoing effort to foster closer exchange and cooperation between Singapore and India. These symposiums provide the opportunity for a frank and candid uh, sharing of views and perspectives and, uh, and on India-Singapore relations and on their interactions with other parts of the world. Today's symposium could hardly be more timely as the close ties between our two nations have a history which is rooted strong uh, in strong uh, economic partnership. Singapore and India commemorated 50 years of their diplomatic relations in 2015 with a joint declaration that elevated their relations to strategic partnership. Today, Singapore is delighted to be an integral part of India's Act East policy, which is built on the foundation of a strong India-ASEAN leadership. Uh, 
I would now like to thank Mr. Chandrajit Banerjee, who is the Director General of, uh, of CII, Confederation of Indian Industries, and Ms. Kiran Prasticha for being partners in this event. I would not want to talk, make a longer speech because I think I would like very much to have Mr. Banerjee also say a few words of welcome. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. Thank you, Ambassador Pillay. It's my pleasure now to invite Mr. Chandrajit Banerjee to do his welcome remarks, please. Minister and Secret, uh, High Commissioners, uh, Ambassadors, Excellencies, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, very, very go uh, warm good evening and welcome to this uh, session as Ambassador Gopidat Pillai has spoken about the Singapore Symposium and for us at CII, it's, it's an honor to always partner with ISAS and especially also with Ananta Center and we've been working very closely on many areas of work. Uh, some of it, of course, was uh, very well highlighted by uh, Ambassador Pillai and uh, today is, uh, today evening is also a very, very special for our institution, CII, because um, we are in this year celebrating what is uh, what we are calling the 25 years of CII in Singapore. So it's been a phenomenal journey the last 25 years uh, of CII's building a relationship with a country from which one has learned so much. And the person who started this uh, relationship on behalf of CII, Mr. Tarundas, is uh, going to be uh, actually moderating the session, as you know, with uh, our minister from Singapore, Mr. Heng. And again, Mr. Heng has been one person from whom uh, 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 we at CII have been able to draw a lot of inspiration in the last many years that one has worked with him in terms of his uh, understanding with him. The CII core group, which visits Singapore every year, calls on him and takes his ideas as to how and what we can work on. You've heard about his uh, contribution in leading negotiations uh, 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 on SICA. Uh, but there, when, when we have shaped our agenda for the next many years to come with Singapore, his inputs have been extremely vital and important for us. And I'll very, very quickly in the next one or two minutes really talk about the type of work that we are doing and we intend to do with Singapore as an institution. And number one is, of course, uh, we all know that we are, there's a lot to learn from Singapore on the entire area of how we can make bu doing business with India easier. And uh, with the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy, CII have been able to tie up with a few very important states of India, uh, six states at this point in time, in seeing how it can get involved in these states to make uh, working in the ground, working in the ground in where investments really take place, make it much easier. The second has been on the national, with the National University of Singapore, the Singapore Management University, and uh, is to get a very strong exchange program done to talk about knowing India, where we are, and our High Commissioner, Mr. Javed Ashraf is present here, he's played a very key role in getting this on the ground, is the interns to get intern students from Singapore to come and work in Indian companies. And uh, this is a young professionals exchange program of uh, getting interns to come and understand Indian corporations. And I think that's a very big, big project that we have embarked upon very recently. The third is the Andhra Pradesh Singapore Business Council that we have formed with Singapore companies and Indian companies working together, getting them to come together to, uh, 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 to look at how there could be many business opportunities that are coming out in, uh, in, in Andhra Pradesh through Amravati, of course, is to see how we can get that collaboration going. So that's a big facilitation work that we are doing. The other area is really very important for tomorrow, and those are 
fintech, startups, and infrastructure. So we have a model that we have created. We call it the fintech sandbox model, which uh, with, again, we work very closely with the Monetary Authority of Singapore and uh, Enterprise Singapore. This idea is to see how we are able to uh, leverage the strength of Singapore's fintech and experiment them in within the sandbox to see how we can get some of the best experiences and best sharing of, uh, best sharing of uh, practices and, and apply those models into India. On the startup side, uh, we have been able to get going with uh, these, again, with Enterprise Singapore uh, to set up a joint uh, startup council where we are getting our two startups, Indian startups and the Singapore startups, to interact with each other and, again, learn from each other's experiences. Uh, lastly, I'd like to really uh, touch upon another very important area. Today, the 90% uh, plus of CII's membership comes from family business. And then when we were talking to Singapore with, with, with our core group, we learned about the family businesses within Singapore. And we, are actually, we have created a network of India-Singapore family businesses, them coming together. There are many concerns to, uh, of which they share, concerns about succession planning, concerns about professionals in their family businesses, and how they, are, and, and, and these case studies of as they share between each other have been ex extremely important. Last, again, I'll, 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 and I kept this as for my last point, because this is one point which has come from Minister Heng, is on skill and skill development. Singapore's phenomenal expertise on skill development is well known. And uh, while there has been G2G linkages on, on skill initiatives, we are very keen to set up Indian private sector to, uh, on, on, on skilling and get that knowledge and expertise really coming from Singapore. And uh, this was sparked off when our, uh, the finance minister was also in charge of education. And he had uh, actually uh, given us this idea of working on skills together. And I must say that, it, number one, it's come a long way. Number two, we see a, a great journey for us uh, waiting ahead because uh, skills is something, as all of us over here in this room agree, is something that we'd all like to invest upon. So there is a lot of work that, to, that, that we have got to do in the, in the next 25 years to come. And we are indeed so delighted and, uh, uh, and happy that we have this evening uh, with, with ve two very important people, the minister himself, who yesterday spoke in Bombay so eloquently about the strategies uh, where India and Singapore can work together, and the person from uh, our side who really led this, uh, uh, this relationship 25 years back, he initiated this, led it for many, many years, and even leads it now through various other forums, uh, like the Strategy Dialogue. Uh, and I'd like to rec uh, have request them to take the evening further and uh, interact with all of you. So ladies and gentlemen, warm welcome, and thank you very much for being here. Thank you, Mr. Banerjee. Ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure now to invite Mr. Heng Sui Kit, Minister for Finance of Singapore, to deliver his address. Minister, please. Well, Ambassador Gopinath Pillay, first uh, let me thank Ambassador Gopinath Pillay and uh, Mr. Tarun Das and uh, Mr. Banerjee for co-organizing this event and for bringing us together. The, I'm very honored by your invitation to speak at this event. I'm very honored that so many of you are here uh, to listen uh, to what I have to say. As uh, Ambassador Gopi said, the inaugural Singapore Symposium was held here almost a decade ago, attended by uh, Minister Mentor Lee Kuan Yew. India and Singapore share a long-standing and deep relationship. 2015 marked the 50th anniversary of diplomatic relations between India and Singapore. PM Modi and PM Lee signed the India-Singapore Strategic Partnership during PM Mo Modi's official visit to Singapore in November this year. And during PM Modi's most recent official visit to Singapore just a month ago, both PMs welcomed the progress in bilateral cooperation and spoke warmly of the growing strategic, economic, and cultural ties 
between both countries. I particularly liked PM Modi's characterization of the relationship between India and Singapore as, I quote, the grace and majesty and the roar of the two lions. Our historical and cultural links are strong. During PM Modi's visit, he inaugurated a plaque on the waterfront marking where Muhammad Gandhi's ashes were scattered off Clifford Pier in 1948. PM Modi also visited the Sri Mariamam Temple on South Bridge Road, the Jamia Chulia Mosque and the Buddha Tooth Relic Temple. This year, we also commemorated 25 years of ASEAN-India relations. In fact, India's ties with Southeast Asia go back even longer, more than a thousand years ago. Written records of maritime links in Sanskrit and Tamil can be found from as early as the 3rd and 4th century. The wave of migration during the colonial period also resulted in the growth of the Indian diaspora across Southeast Asia. And today, about 20% of overseas Indians reside in Southeast Asia. In January this year, we celebrated the Pravasi Bharatiya Divas in Singapore, which showcased the ancient links between India and Southeast Asia, as well as the strong ties that we have forged over the years. Today, we build on these long-standing links to, to enhance our regional cooperation even further. Singapore, as ASEAN's chair this year, remains committed to advancing this partnership. The economic center of gravity is moving back towards Asia. The re-emergence of India and China plays a key role in this. During his official visit to Singapore, PM Modi delivered a keynote address at the Shangri-La Dialogue, the first Indian leader to do so. India and China both made their marks as great civilizations and are now regaining their preeminence, including as twin engines of the Asian growth story. India and China were great powers. Both experienced golden ages, the Gupta Empire in India and the Tang Dynasty in China, which produced scientific and cultural advances as well as prosperity for their people. I'm told that chess was invented in India during that time, and this might explain your expertise in strategizing and negotiations. While India and China might have enjoyed limited benefits in the earlier waves of industrialization and were left behind, we see significant changes today. Today, both countries are preparing to harness the full benefits of globalization and of the fourth industrial revolution. For India, you have one of the youngest workforce among Asian countries. With the right training and economic environment, this will provide a skilled workforce that can power the Indian economy. And India is working on reforms to reduce poverty and achieve a higher standard of living for your people. China, too, celebrates its 40th anniversary of reform and opening up this year. As India and China re-emerge as regional powerhouses, the rest of the world will be observing with great interest the rise of China and India in a stable and peaceful manner, working in partnership with ASEAN, Japan and South Korea and the rest of the region, will form the backdrop of the Asian growth story. As PM Modi said at the Shangri-La Dialogue, and I quote, Asia of rivalry will hold us all back. Asia of cooperation will shape this century. I'm very much heartened by PM Modi's stance. We must strengthen our collaboration under an open, balanced and inclusive regional architecture so that we can complement one another and progress together. We also support PM Modi's commitment towards a common rule-based order for the region that believes in the sovereignty and equality of all nations, large or small. The central role of ASEAN in the, in, in the region and its future, open and rule-based trade, including through the regional comprehensive 
Economic Partnership or RCEP and strengthening regional connectivity and ensuring freedom of navigation and unimpeded commerce. As a close friend, as well as Chair of ASEAN this year, Singapore will work with India and the rest of the region to realise the full potential of Asia. Asia is in a bright spot in the global economy today. This is part of a broader shift of the economic centre of gravity back to the region. Against the backdrop of slower growth in the developed economies, India is expected to grow by 7.8% in 2019, while ASEAN is projected to grow by 5.3%. India offers significant opportunities in trade, infrastructure, smart cities and digitalisation. PM Modi's policies, such as Made in India and Digital India, seek to capitalise on these opportunities as key drivers of growth for India. India's potential talent pool of 800 million youth holds much promise in benefiting both India and the larger Asian region. These young people will be hungry for economic opportunities and for good jobs. Throughout the region, countries are committing to implementing structural reforms. Globalisation has been a key impetus for the region to undertake these reforms to make our economies more efficient and competitive and harness the benefits of our comparative advantages. This year marks the 40th anniversary of China's reform and opening up of the economy. India too has stepped up its reforms to enhance the business environment. PM Modi highlighted that over 10,000 measures have been introduced over the last two years to improve the ease of doing business in India. So India has moved up 300 spot, uh, 30 spots in the World Bank's Ease of Doing Business Index. And I also commend the landmark achievements by the Indian government in implementing the new broad-based goods and services tax last year. And in fact, while walking in, I just saw this, uh, this uh, special event on the GST increase. Uh, one year, first anniversary. And this replaces the previous cumbersome system of national, state and local levies with a unified value-added tax system. Now, over the longer run, the GST is expected to enhance growth through efficiency gains associated with a common market, improved tax compliance and higher government revenues. India needs to continue implementing such reforms to boost overall competitiveness and growth prospects. ASEAN too is a region of opportunities. ASEAN celebrated its 50th anniversary last year. And over the last 50 years, ASEAN's GDP per capita rose 32 fold from US $122 in 1967 to US $4,021 in 2016. Economic liberalisation and integration, in particular through the ASEAN economic community, has been a key driver for this growth. Intra-regional trade in goods today is largely tariff-free and non-tariff barriers have been reduced. Services regulations have been made less stringent and more transparent. Investment rules are more pro-business now. And with a relatively young population, growing middle class and rapid urbanisation, ASEAN's full potential has yet to be realised. According to a McKinsey study, ASEAN's consuming class will double to 163 million households by 2030, driving demand for a wide range of goods and services. Many ASEAN countries also plan to increase spending, especially on infrastructure, and this will enhance growth, productivity and competitiveness. So growth prospects in the region continues to look positive. Against the current protectionist sentiments in other parts of the world, I'm very heartened to see the deepening linkages within the region, as well as our continued collective commitments to open markets and regional integration. China continues to be ASEAN's largest trading partner today, and in 2016, China and ASEAN trade reached $368 billion. And in terms of FDI, China is ASEAN's fourth largest source, with $9.8 billion of inflows in 2016. India is ASEAN's sixth largest trading partner with US $58.4 billion in trade and India was also ASEAN's seventh largest source of FDI in 2016 
at US $1 billion. So I believe that there is potential to do much more between India and ASEAN. And given our close linkages with India, Singapore serves as a good gateway for Indian companies to access the ASEAN market, and many companies continue to do so. There are now about 8,000 Indian companies in Singapore and more than 440 companies from Singapore uh, in India. Now, let me now offer some ideas on how we can do more together. At the shangri PM Modi spoke of how connectivity can unite the region and enhance trade and prosperity. So on that note, I'd like to elaborate on four connectivities that we can work together on. First, trade connectivity. The Comprehensive Economic Cooperation Agreement or SICA between India and Singapore remains a cornerstone of our growing economic partnership. So I remember fondly my days as Chief Negotiator of SICA, which brought me to not only to Delhi but to various parts of India. And I'm pleased that it has brought about stronger economic benefits to both sides. SICA, together with the avoidance of double tax taxation agreements and an enhanced air services agreement, provided new opportunities for our people and businesses. Total bilateral trade grew from 16.6 billion in 2005, the year the agreements were signed, to 25.2 billion in 2017. SICA also promoted greater trade in services, which more than tripled from 3 billion to 10 billion in 2016. And under SICA, Indian banks such as State Bank of India and ICICI and Singapore banks such as DBS and UOB have been able to enter one another's economy and help to support growth. And I'm pleased that SICA has recently uh, and been enhanced through a second review. The enhanced agreement will see more Indian and Singapore companies lower their cost of doing business and thus improve their competitiveness. And consumers will also benefit from lower prices for higher quality products. But beyond the bilateral relations, I am glad that SICA paved the way for the wider ASEAN India FTA in 2009, as well as the bilateral FTAs between India and other ASEAN members and with Korea and Japan, with South Korea and Japan. Enhanced market access creates new opportunities for India exporters and for the region as a whole as well as collective growth, our collective growth potential expands when this business and economic linkages are enlarged. So we must continue advancing the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, or RCEP, and work towards its early conclusion. The RCEP will be a game changer. For the first time, the key players of our region, ASEAN, India, China, Japan, South Korea, Australia and New Zealand will be part of a single economic agreement. Together, we account for almost half of the world's population, approximately 30% of global output and global trade, and a fifth of global foreign direct investment inflows, based on 2016 figures. The completion of RCEP will be a concrete show of our commitment to open trade and investments and to the continued growth and development of our economies and provide more opportunities for our people. And for India, RCEP creates a pathway for making India products to the regional market and beyond. And this will create a much needed jobs for India's youth. So I'm glad that PM Modi committed to, and I quote, reach an early conclusion for the RCEP. So we look forward to working closely with India to conclude RCP ne negotiations, hopefully by the end of this year. So I've spoken about the first connectivity, trade connectivity, and how trade enhances opportunities for our people. Let me now move on to talk about the second connectivity, infrastructure connectivity. Infrastructure needs across Asia are large. PM Modi mentioned in Singapore that, and I quote, the biggest infrastructure story of the world is unfolding in India, unquote. And that last year, India built nearly 10,000 kilometers of national highways, and that's 27 kilometers daily. I just uh, had a meeting with Minister Nitin uh, Gakara and spoke about, and asked him about his priorities, and he had a very, very long list. 
and uh, you know he had a, a wonderful list of things that he wants to do, to get done. Now done well, investments in infrastructure can help boost productivity and economic competitiveness, and lift the long-term potential of India and the region. The Indian government recognizes this and has embarked on its ambition to build 100 smart cities. Under Singapore's chairmanship this year, ASEAN too has embarked on the ASEAN Smart Cities Network Initiative. But what is a smart city? Ultimately, it's not about using technology, but using technology to improve the lives of our people. For instance, a, a smart city is not just technologically advanced, but also environmentally sustainable. And this is in line with PM Modi's vision of a clean India, clean rivers, clean air, and clean cities. India is making good strides in this area. I learned that it's already the sixth largest producer of renewable energy in the world. A smart city uses technology to improve the lives of people. I recently visited Japan and learned about how they are leveraging on Industry 4.0 to work towards Society 5.0. Society 5.0 is a vision of a smart city where innovations like the Internet of Things, Big Data, Artificial Intelligence and Robotics are used to develop solutions for better human life. So I hope that our network of smart cities across ASEAN, across India, across the region will become nodes of excellence that can drive sustainable development. Now to develop uh, this connectivity in infrastructure and to build a connect connectivity for the Asian region and to make our little contribution here, Singapore recently set up Infrastructure Asia office which seeks to harness the collective network and capabilities of public sector agencies and private sector firms and partner key stakeholders across the region to catalyze more project opportunities to meet Asia's infrastructure needs. The Infrastructure Asia office will bring together the demand of project site as well as the supply or financing site of infrastructure projects and facilitate the matching of this demand and supply. One platform to do this is the Asia-Singapore Infrastructure Roundtable, which will be held in October this year. So I hope that Indian companies can join us for the roundtable and look forward to additional ways to partner the Infrastructure Asia office. I hope that Infrastructure Asia office can pave the way for more investments in Indian infrastructure, joining entities like Singapore entities like PSA, Changi Airport International, Ascender Singbridge, Sambawang and Samsit Solar who have invested in ports, IT parks, power plants, and other services and facilities in India. Now, India and Singapore can also jointly collaborate with other countries on infrastructure development. For example, I'm told that Japanese companies are well received in India and have been investing well in projects such as the Delhi Metro project. South Korean companies are, otherwise, are also in, likewise investing in, in India and the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, which is headquartered in uh, Beijing, has just had its third meeting in Mumbai. And we had a very uh, productive meeting in Mumbai on what the AIB can do together with World Bank and the ADB to build infrastructure for the region, or to finance infrastructure for the region. Now, our model for collaborations one model of collaboration that has been quite successful is a joint development of industrial parks by Singapore in other countries, such as the Singapore Industrial Park, the Suzhou Industrial Park in China. And with Vietnam, we have uh, now seven Vietnam-Singapore Industrial Park. So this is something that India and Singapore can collaborate together, either bilaterally or in partnership with a third country. So I've touched on the first two areas, trade, as well as uh, infrastructure connectivity. Let me now move on to the third area, which is about improving air connectivity. With the growing linkages within the region, good air connectivity is essential to support greater trade, investment, and tourism flow. And it is a critical factor in unlocking India's as well as Asia's growth potential. A study by the International Air Transport Association, or IATA, estimates that a 10% improvement in Indian air connectivity 
could potentially lead to an increase in GDP of US $604 million for the Indian economy. As seen in many countries, the availability of air services to many destinations is a key driver of foreign investment. And this is certainly the case for Singapore. India's Uday Dash Kaam Nagrik or Udan Regional Connectivity Scheme was a good step in improving internal air connectivity within India. And there is scope to further develop India's external connectivity as well, to realize India's vision of being a global manufacturing hub and an attractive destination for investments and tourism. I shall share with you a little a story. Uh, Sikha was a, a, a difficult uh, negotiation because it took us three years. But one of the reasons was that I insisted that we should also have an air services agreement, uh, an enhanced air services agreement with India. Because I, I said that there's no point in negotiating an investment agreement if business people cannot move freely between one country and the other and if goods cannot flow more freely. And uh, the, it was most difficult and uh, the Indian authorities did not agree. So I managed to persuade our uh, Ministry of uh, Civil uh, Trade of Transport to unilaterally allow jet airways to enter Singapore without any reciprocal arrangements. And within the first few months, the air traffic jumped so significantly it was far more than what we had achieved for many years that uh, it led to uh, a change in the stance and I'm glad that we managed to have more air connectivity. So really air connectivity uh, is critical in facilitating the movement of people and talent in the region. And India, Indian tourists is now our third largest source of tourists in Singapore. At, and uh, we had over 1.3 million visitors from India. And as I said uh, before, this is a very impressive number, 1.3 million. But against India's population of almost 1.3 billion people, I think there's still a lot more room to grow. And uh, I've also been happy that the air services have also facilitated the movement of talent and enabled our institutions of higher learning, for example, to collaborate more closely with one another. Yeah. The Singapore's Nanyang Technological University, who is now headed by Professor Subra, uh, recently signed an MOU with some leading Indian universities to strengthen academic and industry partnership, including the joint PhD programs with uh, IIT Madras and IIT Bombay. And as we enhance our business and people with people links, I hope that air connectivity will facilitate that people to people link. And this is something that we should uh, continue to work together on. Now, let me now move on to my last point on connectivity, which is about digital connectivity and innovation. The potential for digital connectivity for blockchains, for mobile technology, to build a more inclusive society is only just being realized. So India recently made bold moves towards financial inclusion through Digital India and the National Aadhaar system to streamline the administration of social assistance and government applications. I understand that over the past three years, over 300 million new bank accounts were opened by those who had never had one. And now almost every household has a bank account. I was uh, celebrating DBS's 50th anniversary in Mumbai uh, uh, just uh, two days ago. And uh, DBS itself, uh, you know, is now being called the Digital Bank of Singapore. And I think that is a very good development. And the CEO, Piyush, told me that, in fact, the digital banking has enabled him to really realize significant uh, economies, you know, economies of scale, economies of scope. And really, this is a very impressive milestone, impressive way for us to improve financial inclusion. In a startup space, India and Singapore share a similar vibrant ecosystem with both private-led and government-supported incubators and tech accelerators. The presence of more than 7,000 multinational corporations and large enterprises in Singapore makes us a, a useful hub for both India and Singaporean startups to co-innovate new, disruptive, and scalable solutions. And as I said in Mumbai recently, we will be enhancing partnerships among entrepreneurs through the Singapore-India Incubation Program to bring Singapore startups to India. In the longer term, 
Such developments will form a network of innovation and collaboration between Singapore and India, and I'm sure that we'll work very closely with the CII in this effort. We also envision building innovation corridors between Singapore and startup hotspots across India, such as Bangalore, New Delhi, and Mumbai, as well as in the south. And the first innovation corridor of the state of Andhra Pradesh was just launched in April this year. Then another area for collaboration is in FinTech, as agreed between PM Lee and PM Modi during his visit to Singapore. A cross-border payments linkage between Singapore's NETS and India's Rupee was launched during PM Modi's visit. This collaboration will enable Indian travellers to make payments using Rupee at all NETS acceptance points in Singapore, bringing about greater convenience. We have also established a joint working group led by India's Department of Financial Services and the Monetary Authority of Singapore and other relevant agencies to promote knowledge and increase cross-border cross linkages between payment systems in Singapore and India. So I hope that Singapore will serve as a good gateway for India companies you know, to enter the region. And we see much potential for India and Singapore to co-create fintech and digital payment solutions as well as in new areas such as autonomous vehicles, telemedicine and energy innovation. Singapore is organising the Singapore Week of Innovation and Technology, or SWITCH in short, from 17 to 20th of September this year. And SWITCH is the leading platform in Asia to showcase the best ideas, technology and innovation from around the world. And it will be a great networking opportunity for entrepreneurs, corporates and funds in the region. You may also be familiar with Singapore's FinTech Festival, which is taking place from 12 to 16 of November this year. And this festival has been very successful and is now the world's largest platform for the global fintech community. So we welcome Indian startups and companies to participate in these events and build their networks for collaboration. In fact, I met several of Indian startups in the last events, last two events in Singapore, and I look forward to seeing more. So let me end with yet another quote from PM Modi during his visit to Singapore earlier this month. And he said, I quote, The future is a world of unlimited opportunities. It belongs to us. It is up to us to be ambitious and bold to seize it. This evening tells us that we are on the right path. The two lions shall step into the future together, unquote. Together, indeed, we can do great things to improve the lives of our people and those in the region. And I look forward to deeper collaborations in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you, Minister. I now invite Mr. Tarundas to join Minister on stage for the interactive session. Mr. Das, please. Thank you, Minister, for that uh, very comprehensive address. You know, Minister, we've got an audience here, which is um, corporates, um, diplomatic call from other countries. We've got uh, senior um, officers of the armed services, admirals, air marshals, generals. We've got Mr. Vinod Rai here, former Auditor General of India. He's more famous now because he's president of the Board of Cricket Control of India and uh, many others. Um, we've got Mr. Sanjay Singh, former Secretary of External Affairs. So I'm going to take you away from some of the points that you made in your speech to something else. You were like a chief executive to Mr. Lee Kuan Yew. All right, you had a different designation, but effectively you were the head of his office for several years. So what was it like working with Mr. Lee Kuan Yew? Well, thank you, Tarun. Uh, uh, this is a very interesting question. I, I think uh, working for uh, Mr. Lee, Mr. Lee uh, is really a highlight of my career. I, I learned so much uh, from him. 
and uh, the and also so much from uh, Mrs. Lee. So the, my very first meeting, I must have looked quite nervous, and uh, Mr. Lee, uh, Mrs. Lee, saw me and said, "Oh, young man, you know, calm down. Uh, Mr. Lee is okay." <laughs> and uh, I, I found him to be, uh, you know, people said, "Oh, Mr. Lee has very strong views, and uh, you, uh, you should never argue against him because he, he has very strong views." And I found that actually to be true and untrue. Indeed, he has strong views. But the reason why he has strong views is that he thinks very deeply about many issues before he articulates his opinion. And once he does that, he does not change it easily because he has thought so hard about it. But at the same time, um, he's also actually very open-minded. And uh, so after sitting through several meetings, I found that uh, to, be, to be true. So. Gradually, I, I sat in, in almost all his meetings with visitors, and uh, gradually, I sort of had the courage to ask him, I said, you know, Mr. Lee, um, you said this, and uh, I began some small little discussions with him, and I, I'm glad that, uh, you know, he didn't find me uh, silly for saying all those things. And uh, I, I learned a lot because after those sessions, uh, he, he discussed all these meetings with me quite uh, often during our, uh, in a day when I was working for him. And I, I found that not only did I learn a lot during sitting in his meetings, but I learned a lot also discussing the, the progress of the meeting after that. And uh, of course, I learned a lot with him during the, our very difficult project in uh, China, the Suzhou Industrial Park project. Because uh, it was a, because we had so many government officials from China visiting Singapore to learn about the software, and uh, you know how Singapore planned all these parks, how we did our policies, and uh, Mr. Lee said, well, the best way to learn is not to just attend a course. The best way to learn is to do things together. Then you learn from one another. So when we did that project, uh, af after all, we did learn a lot. We did we found that actually. Um, Singaporeans have, over time, evolved a very different way of working. And the Chinese were just beginning to open up, and they had a very different way of working. And that led to a lot of uh, misunderstanding of what we were trying to do. But I'm glad that uh, we went through that, because you know, by being in the trenches together, we learned uh, together. And uh, Mr. Lee, I was very surprised, because when Mr. Lee went on, he, he decided to go public about the difficulties that we had. And uh, many people were warning him that, Mr. Lee, this is bad for your reputation. You are well known to be successful in everything that you do. And uh, Mr. Lee's point is that I'm not interested in uh, preserving my reputation per se. I'm interested in getting it done. You know? So I have found him to be a man with tremendous courage to do the right thing, regardless of how others think of him. And in fact, uh, one of his uh, famous quote is, I don't believe in being politically correct. I believe in being correct. So I, I learned a lot from him. That's a great, great, great answer. Um, you know, because our image of him is that he had, what you said, great courage. Um, he had the ability to take risk based on his thinking through issues which you referred to. So he had to take risk to reform Singapore society or to do things outside. So he was an entrepreneurial leader? I would say very much so. And uh, one very, I, I think he's, he's entrepreneurial at, at the same time, he is very, uh, he has foresight and he thinks very about the long term. I mean, he's not interested in, the, in just the short-term survival of Singapore, because we recognize deeply that you know, we are a little island, and for us to succeed uh, in the long run, we need to think long-term, we need to do difficult things. And uh, he, had a, he had a great courage in doing that. So just to give you an example, which I felt very deeply as finance minister. Okay? Now, guess what was 
my ministry is, you know, largest source of revenue to fund our expenditure uh, in the last budget in 2018. So in 2018, I announced that we are going to have a GST increase from 7% to 9%. And uh, I said we are going to have this increase from uh, sometime between 2021 and 2025. And people thought, my goodness, this finance minister, crazy fellow, you know. He announced a tax increase so many years ahead of time and didn't tell us when exactly. But he tells us exactly that he's going to move from 7 to 9%. Now, the, the truth is that it is not corporate income tax, it is not personal income tax, it is not GST uh, that today is the largest source of revenue for my expenditure, for our expenditure in Singapore. The largest source of revenue is what we call the net investment returns. And where did the net investment returns come from? Uh, Singapore had no oil, no natural resources of any kind, but we have reserves. We have uh, uh, official reserves. And uh, in the reserves, we had uh, Mr. Lee and uh, our founding uh, finance minister and deputy prime minister, uh, Dr. Go, who decided that in the very early years of our development, we were growing 8, 10, and beyond 10%. And as a result of which, revenue was coming in very strongly every year. But instead of spending that revenue to make people happy, they took very difficult decisions and uh, spent the money very wisely. So when I went to school, uh, we used to joke that our school were like cookie cutter schools. You know? if our teachers, uh, when I became education ministers, our teachers were joking with me that if you were were teaching in school A, you could go to school B, blindfold yourself and still go to the toilet. Because in order to build schools cheaply, the schools had almost identical design and every primary school was like every other primary school. You know? But where did, uh, where did they spend the money? They spent the money in paying teachers well. And so we had some really good teachers. And when I became finance minister, the best thing I have in our education system as our teachers. I mean, they, they are wonderful, they did a great job, and uh, in order to make sure that they are not, you know, uh, uh, they, that they are properly uh, remunerated, we have a fairly competitive uh, salary system for our teachers. So they are not going to be uh, rich, but they are, you know, at least uh, fairly well off. And we, so we invest in the right thing, we invest in, in that. So one of the th great things that he did was that they save all the money, and they save all the money, and we had the reserves. And uh, from the reserves, we now are able to draw on as our population ages. And uh, instead of issuing debt to, uh, to fund our expenditure, what we did was that we issued debt. In fact, I, I issued quite a lot of debt when I was running the Monetary Authority of Singapore. Not because we needed the money, but we issued the debt to create the benchmark U curve for the development of the bond market. So I think thinking long term allows us to do some bold things, which hopefully will take us to a better future. So you chaired, or you are chairing this committee of ministers about future of the economy. So is this all about long term? Is it also short term? What are, what are, what are the issues that you're dealing with there? Well, it is really all about long term because if you ask me over the next few years will the Singapore economy grow, I would say, uh, depending on the state of the global economy, the Singapore economy will grow. But at the same time, um, I mentioned to you about the move of the center of gravity, of economic gravity back to Asia. So this is a very good thing. But at the same time, what it must mean is that I think every country, every one of us must hope that our country and our people enjoy a better standard of living. And in doing that, we will want to reform our economy, restructure our economy, which is a very good thing. And I've, I'm very glad that the Asian region is very well regarded because when our neighbors become more prosperous, we too can become more prosperous. If all our neighbors are poor, there'll be nothing to sell to one another. And so therefore, I firmly believe that prosperity in the Asian region is good for all. But at the same time, in order to work together and complement one another, 
as our neighbours uh, restructure the economy, we too must do that. And if we don't do that, we are going to be out of the game. So that's the first point. Second point is that I've been looking at how technology is changing the global economy so significantly. ICT is only one example, but you know the unraveling of the unveiling of the human genomes, the changes in renewable energy, the progress made uh, in space technology, in communications, in satellite, all these are going to have very significant effects on every industry. And uh, if we don't take technology seriously uh, and invest in R&D, again, we're going to be left behind. So the work that I'm doing is very much that. But more importantly, uh, we are putting a very strong focus on uh, skills development and uh, on education. I think we must continue to reform our education system and to make lifelong learning not just a buzzword, but really a reality. And in that regard, uh, this will be one of the things that we are putting in the most effort. Because machines can replace humans, but a also augment and enhance humans. And if we can do that well, we will be, everyone else will be better off. You are one of the countries where the population is aging, am I right? So um, your workforce will be impacted. And uh, how, how are you thinking, how are you going to deal with an aging population? What, what kind of infrastructure, social infrastructure or facilities or what do you do for older people? Well, so, so we are doing uh, uh, a few things. One, of course, is that uh, we have to think about healthcare needs for our older population. And uh, in our case, for when we celebrated our Golden Jubilee, we set aside uh, 9 billion Singapore dollars into a special package to provide uh, more subsidies for, our, uh, for what we call the pioneer generation. Because this was, they were the pioneers who really worked, who worked really hard during the early years of our independence and for which when the economy was just beginning to develop, their wages were not very high. And right now, the, they are growing older they have less education than the younger people. And it is, it is, I think it's our duty to really look after them well. And uh, so we have the Pioneer Generation Package. And so we have to continue to look at what we need to do for uh, supporting our elderly population. That's number one in the healthcare. And that's why I announced a GST increase so, so ahead of time. Because in my discussion with the health minister, we knew that's going to go up. The second thing that we are doing is to build that community support. So the health minister and I piloted a scheme called the Community Network for Seniors, where we mobilize younger, uh, young, young O to look after the OO. And uh, this is done in all, we started a pilot in uh, three constituencies, where we get the young O to visit the OO, get everybody together, we created uh, centers for which they can come together to interact with one another, to exercise, to have uh, healthy food, and so on. And it has been uh, so well received, we decided that we'll scale it nationwide. So we're in the midst of doing that. And the third thing we're doing is to look at how we can uh, continue to encourage older people to stay active and uh, to do work of various kind. And that's why I was in Japan recently, to look at what the Japanese are doing to uh, enable their older people to continue working. Because I think the, our notion of O needs to be updated. I mean, lifespan is, uh, has increased significantly and the uh, age of active life has also increased. So what used to be a retirement age today really ought to be a different age tomorrow. And therefore, we are looking into all these issues to see how we can get people to stay active. And I should say that work is not just about making money. It's also about uh, maintaining your social circle. I mean, you and I working for many years, you have a group of friends, a group of co-workers that you uh, see every day, you have an active lifestyle, and you cannot be just uh, sitting at home and doing nothing when you know, all of a sudden and you're retired and you do nothing. So I think we need to look into these issues carefully. The big thing that happened in Singapore recently, one big thing happened recently, uh, two heads of government met there, President Trump and uh, President Kim, Chairman Kim. Um,
to a lot of us, it gives a perception that Singapore was the venue because there was a mutual confidence in Singapore as a venue, that there was mutual trust in Singapore as a venue. So how, how did Singaporeans, how did you all feel? Uh, how was the reaction, the response uh, to having this summit there, um, messing up the country uh, to some extent because of probably traffic and movement restrictions and all of that. But I mean, it was a great, great kind of a global event. The whole world was there, the whole media world, certainly. So what, can you share something with us on that? Well, um, the, uh, I, I would say that the vast majority of Singaporeans uh, were very glad that we, we could do that, that we could play a small role in uh, bringing this together. And even though I would say that this is this, this will be a long process, but at least the very first major step, first big step is taken to have this summit. And I mean, if we can make a small contribution to global peace and stability, I think it is, uh, it is worthwhile doing. And uh, some people ask if this was planned long in advance, and the answer is no. In fact, uh, even right to the last minute, we weren't sure whether this was going to take place because there were a lot of changes in mind of whether it, even the summit would take place. And I must say that my, uh, my colleague, uh, Minister Vivian Balakrishnan, did a very good job. And so did the Minister for Home Affairs, uh, Shamugam, because the security forces were on the really high alert. Um, so the reaction of most Singaporeans have been very positive. They are glad that we could do that. Uh, there's a small minority uh, of uh, the people who went on the internet when the PM said that we spent $20 million, Singapore, uh, on providing security for the summit and say, oh, you know, you could have spent it uh, better on me. <laughs> you know? But uh, I would say that it's a, a minority. And I think it's, uh, to me, it's a, a price worth uh, paying. It is our small little contribution to, the, to world peace. And really, if you don't have peace and stability in the region, uh, all our talk of economic development will just be talk. Let's take a quick round of questions from the floor, one round. And I will ask, we'll take maybe three questions and you answer all of them in go. Are there mics uh, with, uh, who would like to start? Yes, quick one please, yeah. name? I'm Professor Sudhir Kumar Jain, IIT Delhi. Okay. Uh, my question is, sir, uh, here, here. Uh, see, uh, Singapore joined Malaysia and got separated out in early 60s. And then, at that time, India and Singapore, there was not really much difference. Singapore has a very success story. What can we learn, a very big population country like India, from your strategies? Can you think of some strategy for us, for a big population country like this? Thank you. Uh, gentleman next to you. Your name, sir? Yeah, General Chopra. General Chopra. Uh, my intervention has been triggered by this mention of multilateralism through by all the speakers. It's, and India is additionally multi-aligned and multilateral. What I know from, want to know from you is that this current wave of deglobalization, protectionism, unilateralism, the question is how can both of us, India and Singapore, despite India not being part of the BRI, how can we take advantage, leverage, to fill in this gap that has come about? Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. Yes, Professor. Can I put two short questions? One is, RCEP is being discussed everywhere. Why is it not being held? Who is responsible? Why responsible? And for what reasons? You want him to answer that question in Delhi? Why not? I, mean, <laughs> I want to know what it is happening. Secondly, uh, you're right, Minister. You said uh, India adopted the Act East policy from Look East policy in order to be more engaged with the region and to be more relevant to the region. Have you found any difference between the two policies on the ground? So you have four questions. Well, uh, uh, 
So let, let me first answer the first question about what uh, Professor Kumar, and what uh, Singapore, uh, you know, what, what lessons can Singapore offer? I would say that uh, I, I, I have to be very humble about that because, you know, we are a, a small nation and our population, the whole population of Singapore is not even the population of uh, Delhi or Mumbai. So what works for a small place uh, may, may or may not work for uh, a big place. And uh, I, I do know that the dynamics here are a lot more uh, complex and the potential is also very different because uh, if I were in your position, I'll say I would be exploring quite a lot of uh, things. But if you ask me from my own experience negotiating trade agreements for many years, uh, including at the Doha round and looking at the economic developments all around the world, uh, I would say that uh, the, our willingness to uh, undertake structural reforms of our economy is probably the most uh, critical. And in that regard, uh, I thought Prime Minister Abe uh, talked about the three arrows in the, of Abenomics, monetary policy, fiscal policy, structural policies. And indeed, I think he summed it up quite well, that uh, in monetary policy, when I was running the central bank, we need to be very clear that monetary policy, you can give a short-term boost to the economy, and make sure, but you cannot give it long-term growth. For fiscal policy, we need to um, be very clear that again, uh, there has to be certain level of fiscal sustainability because the crisis of the, in the Asian financial crisis as well as the global crisis was when uh, some of our macroeconomic uh, measures get completely out of whack and it will come back and haunt us. So monetary and fiscal policy are very useful uh, instruments for managing the cycle, for looking at short term, but in the end it's structural policy. And structural policies involve education, involves getting our companies to do better, building corporate capabilities, involve uh, investment in science and technology. And part of this has to be linked to globalization. I, I have not, communism failed when it tried to keep up everybody and it tried to plan centrally everything. But capitalism has been a lot more successful because the entrepreneurial energy of different people can come to play and that diversity is uh, useful and necessary. But that doesn't mean that government don't have a role. Government need to be able to provide a good framework for that. So I'll say that it's a complex issue about growth and development, but each of us will have to study the, base, the, the conditions and to see what we can do. Now, on the second question about um, the, uh, uh, um, you know, the BRI and you know what we could do and uh, the trade agreements, uh, what India can do. I would say that um, the the when we concluded the SICA review, uh, it was at least a very good step forward, even though it took us seven years. But I'm hoping that uh, we could do a third third round of review and do it even better. But at the same time, the ASEAN-India uh, agreement has, has kicked in. I understand that uh, when I was in Mumbai and talking to various business people, I understand that views in India about the value of free trade uh, varies very significantly. And uh, I, I would urge greater discussion on this because I think uh, if, 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 if there are countries that can benefit uh, quite significantly from free trade, you will be the larger economies. So if you look at, uh, I mean, large and small economies all benefit. But you look at uh, the US economy, how it has grown, and how US companies, you look at Fortune 500. How many of the Fortune 500 companies are American companies? And how many of them are companies that have global operations and they sell globally? And uh, I, I hope that that change uh, can take place. If you look at what is happening in China today, China previous uh, policy was to draw in more FDI because they realized that they cannot just rely on their state-owned enterprises. In fact, the state-owned enterprises need to, to be reformed. They drew in foreign direct investment that in turn brought in technology, brought in skills, created good jobs for its people. And now it also created a lot of competition for their domestic sector. It opened up opportunities for very entrepreneurial people to start businesses. 
So if you look at companies like Alibaba, Alipay, uh, Tencent, WeChat, Baidu, this was started by uh, entrepreneurs from nowhere. But they made a big name for themselves and they are now very, very big companies. And they are now looking to get out. And they now China has a policy of getting out. And that's why I'm happy that you know, over 8,000 Indian companies are in Singapore. So I think there's a lot of opportunities uh, to continue to open up. And I do feel strongly that RCEP uh, will be of value to India. And as to the question about why RCEP is not done, I would not be able to uh, uh, answer that directly because I'm not directly involved in the negotiations. Uh, all I do know is that uh, our uh, trade ministries are, are discussing, and I understand that even between uh, uh, China and India, they are discussing this uh, very closely. Uh, if you were to ask me what should be done, I'll say that uh, think about how trade agreements can stimulate domestic reforms. Because uh, the experience of Singapore is that when our companies are faced with major competition, they really uh, gear up. Yeah. But if when they are not facing competition, they are in trouble. And the one sector which I used to think that they, would, they are safe is our domestic retail sector. But now with uh, e-commerce taking off so rapidly in Singapore uh, and in many parts of the world, even your pop and mom shop, your little corner shop, is not immune from global competition. And the consumers are very happy. They are the ones who buy it, right? Yeah. But uh, the, the, the people are the ones who are buying uh, abroad. So I recently went to a, a bookshop with my daughter. So I said, so my daughter said, Dad, why do, why do you need to buy a book from a bookshop? So I said, uh, well, I just feel sentimental about bookshop. I am prepared to pay a little more to support the bookshop. And he said, Dad, I, I can buy for you much cheaper uh, online. So I said, never mind. I'll buy, I'll, I'll buy this, you know. Because uh, but I think I'll be a dying breed because uh, people like my daughter will be, will be having a completely different experience. And uh, I, I see books mailed to my house uh, every few days because my daughter and my sons are buying books uh, online all the time. One last question, though we are out of time. Ambassador Mukherjee. Thank you so much. Uh, I thought in any case, they should, you should have at least one lady asking you a question. Absolutely. To make it gender sensitive. I have actually two questions. One is on the free trade agreements where you said we need to take a rethink. Could you tell us in your perspective whether you really think that India is ready for a very open, broad-ranged free trade agreement, for example, the one where the European Union has now been stuck for many, many years, exactly because we, f we fear that if we open up completely on a totally reciprocal basis, uh, we may not benefit. That's my first question. And the other question is that given your experience, how do you feel Brexit, which is coming next year, uh, is going to impact trade and development in this part of the world, Singapore? And do you have any advice for India on how we should handle Brexit vis-a-vis uh, -vis trade with the EU? Thank you very much. Well, Ambassador Mukherjee, first, uh, thank, you. thank you very much. I'm very happy to see uh, you know, a lady asking this question. Uh, first, on, the, uh, on your first question, on do I think that you know, you know, a free trade system will be, uh, uh, will be good for India? Now, um, I, th I think when we look at trade uh, negotiations and trade agreements, there are different degrees of, uh, of openness. But the important question is, what is our long-term direction? Is our direction going to be more and more open? Or is our direction going to be, you know, I will stay close and I'll become closer and closer? Because uh, my, my own belief is that free trade benefits you know, all because it creates a bigger pie. But there are winners and losers in free trade. And it is very important for us to make sure that there is some way in which we can help those who are left behind. And how do we do that? I think we have to do that with very good structural policies. So the opening of trade and the domestic restructuring of the economy cannot be separated. It has to be taken as one piece. 
And in particular, the training of our people will be quite critical. Now, for Singapore, we had no choice uh, that right from the beginning, we adopted free trade uh, because, and I'm very, very glad that uh, Prime Minister uh, Lee and uh, his first generation of uh, cabinet colleagues decided on that. Because I, I learned about all our trade policies when I became uh, a secretary, permanent secretary of the Trade and Industry Ministry and I had to go through all the documents because we were then embarking on the next phase which is all our free trade agreements. And uh, I, I'm convinced after our own experience that it, it has benefited. I look at the experience in ASEAN countries when I was negotiating the ASEAN agreements, there were a small group of us, permanent secretaries and all that, who were quite like-minded. But on the other hand, when, we went back to the, when they went back to the capitals, the political leaders had a very different view because they got lobbied by vested interests and so on. And so um, we decided that never mind, we, we would set a time frame that we will have the ASEAN economic community by a certain year. And year by year, as the experience of uh, free air trade took hold, we were able to bring the deadline closer and closer and become more and more ambitious. So I'll say that it is a process, but it can be, it, it ought to be the direction. And uh, it, because if we don't, we cannot improve the standard of living uh, in any significant way. The second question on Brexit, uh, what advice do I have? Um, First, if you ask me, I think Brexit was uh, a mistake. I've been reading the documents about how Brexit, how the vote even turned out that way. I've been reading about the promises that the politicians who were going for Brexit uh, were promising the people and coming up with data which was unfortunately, I would say, quite misleading, that uh, they were extolling the virtues of going alone and, and talking about uh, the terrible things about the, the you know, staying in the EU. So I think for the UK, it, it, is, it is not a good thing for the UK, but the, Theresa May has decided that they will stick with it. You know, you cannot have a second vote on this, and they are trying to make the best of it now. And I hope that uh, they can. I, I see the UK extending uh, their uh, cooperation out to many of the countries that are part of the Commonwealth. And I think that this is a good thing and that we should find new ways that we can work with the UK, whether it's in trade, whether it's investments, uh, whether it is in uh, financial services, in the movement of people, and see how we can work together. Uh, Switzerland is a very good example that they are not in the EU. Uh, they are in the Schengen area, and they have been uh, doing well. So it is possible, I think, for the UK to do well. Uh, again, it goes back to the, my first point, that unless the uh, UK also takes this opportunity to restructure this economy, uh, it, trade is not the enemy, trade is our friend, and if we need to make sure that we know how to work with our friends. Minister, our time is up. Yeah. There's a lady there with a gun pointing towards us, and okay. she's going to take the mic. It's been great being with you, thank you. and uh, thank you for your very thoughtful and very clear, articulate answers. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Minister and Mr. Tarandas, for such an engaging, insightful session. It's now my pleasure to invite Professor C. Raja Mohan to give his vote of thanks. Professor Raja, please. So one small ritual before we close, and I'm sure dinner is waiting for us, so I don't want to take too long. Uh, let me just say that uh, we're delighted to be here and uh, in the Institute of South Asian Studies, of which I've recently become the director, uh, has been very much part of the India-Singapore story. Uh, it was said before that uh, uh, how Singapore and India, I, mean, I think the evolution of the relationship, that uh, Singapore has been the bridge for India to Southeast Asia, to East Asia and more broadly, and of uh, integrating India 
uh, in the last 25 years uh, to uh, the world of globalization uh, in the rest of Asia. Uh, as we begin a new journey today, I think India and Singapore, uh, we hope that ISAS, uh, which has uh, contributed in the last many years to uh, expanding and the intensifying the relationship by studying contemporary developments in South Asia, uh, will also, I think, respond to the new challenges that are emerging. Uh, if you go back to the history of India-Singapore, when I think uh, Singapore's formation was very much linked to undivided India, uh, and undivided India's uh, engagement uh, with uh, East Asia, that is China. Uh, next year, we're going to celebrate the 200th anniversary of uh, formation of Singapore, linked to the East India Company, to the British Raj, and to the resources of the undivided subcontinent. But today, I think in, in the last uh, uh, 25 years, when India returned to a phase of globalization, Singapore played a very critical role uh, in facilitating India's integration uh, with the region. But today, I think uh, we, are, we have, as I said, we have a different set of complexities facing us. As Minister Heng pointed out, there are at least three great disruptions that are beginning to unfold. One, a disruption uh, in, uh, in the globalization process, where there's a backlash against globalization in the developed world, whether it is Brexit or whether it is Trump. So the, it is a new feature of the world life, and we have to deal with it. Second, uh, Mr. Heng has also talked about a power shift uh, that has taken place an economic power shift that will also reflect in the geopolitical shift that is that is beginning to take shape. A third one is mentioned when he talked about the digital connectivity uh, is about the, uh, the disruption in technology. Uh, curiously, I think our ability to handle the first two disruptions will depend a lot on how we deal with the third disruption. That is, if we can better handle the transformation in technology that is taking place, we'll be better equipped, both India and Singapore, uh, in coping with the profound changes that are taking place uh, in, the, in the world today. And I think one of our future agendas for ISAS is going to be how we deal with this technological transformation that is taking place. The minister talked about uh, digital connectivity or smart cities. So it's really the use of innovation use of technological transformation to deal with the older problems of development within India, as well as uh, Singapore's advancement in a, in a more complex world. So I think this is going to be one of the top areas that we're going to work on in the coming years, innovation, uh, growth, and prosperity through technological innovation. Singapore is already the third, you know, is number three in the Bloomberg Global Index on Innovation. Uh, India is there sometimes, sometimes not, but I think there are pretty strong hotspots of innovation in India, and in Bangalore, in Pune, in Hyderabad, and in many places. So one of the things that India and Singapore are talking about today is how do you link Singapore, where a large number of Indian IIT graduates, Indian IIM graduates, and the new Indian talent is making huge contributions to growth of technological innovation. And I think that's where uh, how we link this, how we take advantage of these new bridges that are emerging between India and Singapore. Uh, that is a challenge, and it's a huge opportunity as well. So let me stop here and thank uh, Minister Heng for being with us uh, twice over, both in uh, Bombay and today in, uh, in Delhi. Thank you, sir, for, for, for giving us a very stimulating uh, uh, insights into what's happening in the world. To Tarun Das for steering the discussion today, a long friend of Singapore, and I think uh, CIA, I believe, is going to celebrate 25 years of India-Singapore, so I think that's going to be an event that uh, ISAS, again, will be associated with. To Chandrajit Banerjee for uh, facilitating this, to Kiran Pasricha of Aspen India, I think, who helped us organize this, and lastly, the High Commissioner and the MFA, High Commissioner Lim, and High Commissioner Javed Ashraf, uh, who have actually facilitated, and have actually created a whole new agenda for India-Singapore cooperation. So thank you. Thank you all. And I think let me stop here and uh, welcome you for the dinner. Thank you, Professor Raja. Ladies and gentlemen, we've come to the end of today's Singapore Symposium 2018. On behalf of ISAS, CII, and Ananta Espen, we thank you for your participation and invite you to dinner. While you network, we would like to invite you to watch a video put together by the Institute of South Asian Studies.
International University of Singapore. Established in 2004, ISAS studies contemporary South Asia. ISAS researches on the following. The Institute of South Asian Studies, ISAS, is an autonomous research institute at the National University of Singapore.